Biobalance HealthCast, Episode 237, Hormone Research and Journal Articles. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Lately, we've been reviewing our knowledge of Greek philosophers and Greek myths. <laughs> and in our last podcast, we were talking about Archimedes and the lever. This week, we're going to talk about Sisyphus and the rock. Sisyphus was doomed to push the same rock up a hill every day, and at the end of the day, it would roll back down the hill, and the next day, they'd have to push it back up again. And there are some days when you work in, in dealing with human beings, whether it's counseling and psychology or, or medicine and physiology, that you feel like Sisyphus. You feel like I've been here before. We're going around the same story. We actually, I was having a conversation with somebody at dinner last night about the repetitive cycles of the stories that you hear in counseling. People mm-hmm. come in and say it over and over and over again. And they there, there are rhythms by which, and, and Freud called it uh, repetition syndrome or compulsion, mm-hmm. repetition compulsion, where you keep doing the thing that you've always done that keeps getting you in trouble. And even though you intellectually understand you're not supposed to do that anymore, there's something within you that drives you to do it until you reach a point of of healing where you're no longer driven to do it. And you get Yeah, and that's better. why I couldn't be a counselor because I would shake it and he's like, get over it. I mean, and, I'm like, ah. And there are a lot of people who say that yeah. about counseling. Sorry. You know? Oh, I it just, doesn't help. You just sit there and go, uh-huh. Don't uh, do it again, but, please. But you can't intervene until they're ready. If they can't uh, hear it until they I can know. hear it. I know. And so, but the same thing happens to you in medicine when you are pushing the rock up the hill about the importance of giving people functionally adequate amounts of testosterone and estrogen. <laughs> Because the standard that most doctors know is so uh, such the a limited amount. Standard is amount, give as little as possible. As little as possible, which does not it's make sense. And <laughs> <laughs> because they have, but because they're looking at old research studies from a long time ago, and they won't learn anything. Or now. they're lo- looking at new lawsuit stuff from the dang gum lawyers that are saying, you know, we could sue because that guy gave you testosterone. That's right. dangerous. From you, one study. You could have a stroke or get breast cancer. Because there was one study, yeah. and that, that was... It was a corrupt, flawed study. It was a flawed study, and, they, and many and uh, actually Journal of the AMA retracted a lot of it. Yes. But no one cares about retractions. They just care about the original... They should never have allowed that into well, their like original journal. like when the judge journal. instructs the juror, ignore that. It t- would take right. that out of the record. You didn't hear that. They've already right. heard it. That's right. You know, so doctors so have heard that testosterone causes heart disease and stroke, which it doesn't. Yeah. And because the study was made to scare people. So, so, so push that rock, sis. Let's tell us about the <laughs> studies that are not going anywhere, where the rock just keeps rolling back down the hill. Well, the studies that the studies that I want to talk about are the studies four studies. That were that I pulled from the Journal of Endocrinology. One month issue. One month issue of that journal. Of that one journal. One month issue of the OBGYN journal. Okay. And so I want to I want to illustrate how what the endocrinologists are reading is if they're even reading it about GYN problems and urologic problems because they don't treat that. If they have it, they have all the information and really good research and really well done studies. And it's there, they could read it, but it never crosses over to the people who can use it. And that's the gynecologists. And then the gynecologists spend their time doing studies that are useless. I mean, they do all their OB studies in the Green Journal are great. They're they're helping OBs and doing and great studies on infertility. And then you get to GYN studies, and it's like they don't really care. It's an afterthought. They need to put something in there. So in this one one month, Mm -hmm. in the um, let's go with the OBGYN studies, and we talked about two of them last time. But uh, I just I just wanted to have an illustration, Um, and I I will have them uh, at least the abstracts so that you can find them um, posted with this. So um, factors seeking, uh, excuse me, associated with seeking treatment for urinary incontinence during the menopausal transition, which sounds like, oh, let's see what, what factors there are that cause that would make me think cause mm-hmm. urinary incontinence and how can we fix this? Right. Well, I know that hormones fix it. Right. And that's what I expected when I read the article. Oh no, it's just about what, are all the people in America the same in terms of menopause, basically color, race, uh, ethnicity, and um, 
and religion. So, and it comes up with, oh yeah, there's no real difference in seeking uh, treatment for losing urine. Because who would, really, who would want to lose urine all day long, every time you stand up, every time, I mean, you have to wear diapers. Well, So it, menopause, it, it, you're it 50, you're, you're wearing diapers. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it does. So that's one. So that's useless. I mean, what did that get us? And that was a lot of money spent by the government to actually figure that out. So the next one is, um, it's. I'll translate. It's a. It's called a gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist. That means. Lupron, something that's usually given for endometriosis to diagnose and treat autoimmune progesterone dermatitis. Okay. Mm. So what that means is there are some people allergic to their own progesterone. Yeah. I have to... I have to kind of wonder how often that ever happens because in 20 years I've never seen that. And there is there are rashes of pregnancy which is a very high progesterone state mm -hmm. but we haven't considered it an autoimmune state and but we somebody spent time and money looking at, at this, this very tiny problem right and i and in my mind the way you would treat this is not with diseases or excuse me medicines that decrease your um, immune response which then sets you up for all kinds of other things really high risk testosterone is one of the reasons that if you have adequate testosterone you usually don't get this kind of response but, th but that's fascinating when, when you talk about immune response because you're talking about the immune system yes. and we were having conversations before we started today about people that suffer from cancers and have to take chemo and the ongoing debate about whether chemo which may kill the specific cancer that you have but destroys your immune system as well is a positive or negative should should you undergo chemo and, and you really need to read the research talk to your doctor get some opinions be an informed participant in that process mm -hmm. because sometimes and, and the example that you gave me is that doctors that are treating women for breast cancer that are specialists in that that's area, all they do they do breast they cancer do. that's all they read is about Give cancer. women tamoxifen all the time as as a way to fight the breast cancer mm -hmm. and your point and as a gynecologist is that tamoxifen increases the risk of uterine cancer right in my in my world yeah. now that's not an immune suppressant it's a specific kind of a like, like chemo hor, yeah it's yeah. not an immune suppressant okay. like chemo but it is a hormonal treatment for for breast cancer right so Okay, so we decrease your risk of breast cancer, but we cause uterine cancer. Mm -hmm. So they but don't that's care. not my problem. But but they are very arrogant, and I will say that straight up. They're very arrogant about their cancer and nobody giving their patients hormones. Mm -hmm. But if I complain about give them giving tamoxifen, they go nuts. Right. Because and it's my cancer that I have to deal with. It's that patient's cancer of the uterus, so they're not thinking about that. They're just thinking. They, they almost reject it. I have cancer. great numbers because I've cured you of your breast cancer, but right. then you get, then you get uterine cancer. Now then we go back to, if we go back to, um, chemo. Right. Many people who have very low grade, very early cancers are are given the advice to take chemo, mm -hmm. especially in the breast world, and. That's all well and good if chemo had no other effects on your body. Right. Except it shuts down your immune system. So other cancers, other diseases, other problems creep up. So, so it create you, it you opens become the door. A target rich environment right, for, for opportunistic infections. That's right. And other cancers. You just come flying back, ooh, we'll stop here. Right. And it's you know, your T cells are suppressed. Mm -hmm. Just like in, in people with AIDS. They get cancers all the time. We shut down the the cells that are actually should be killing cancers and in this case are stimulating you know they're trying to stop the cells that are um, stimulating cancers by killing them so basically we're setting you up for all kinds of other kind of cancers if it's an early cancer if it can be treated a different way if you can then or you can nutritionally feed the body so that you can keep your immune system and only target the cells that are the cancer cells fine and if you're and if you have if you have a very an advanced uh, an cancer advanced so your, your, your only chance of, is the chemo right. and that's what you should take but if you have an early cancer that has been excised and they feel like they got it all I have a problem with 
putting setting yourself up for another type of cancer or mm -hmm. setting yourself up for another disease mm -hmm. that is going to eventually uh, take your life. So I have a problem with that. My sister-in-law had leukemia, and she took chemo. Mm -hmm. uh, and she had to be, and, and, and she also had a, a they had to suppress her immune system because they were going to give her a transplant. Right. And she had to be in a sterile environment for almost six months. Mm -hmm. She couldn't go out in public. She, she couldn't run the risk that a baby would sneeze on so, her. So you, you know that the, that is because the cells that actually would normally be your protection right. were would, abnormal. Would the transplant cells. Were, were, were abnormal. Right. So, and they had to suppress... The, those cells that would kill the transplant cells, but they she had they had to get rid of her bone marrow, yeah. which had which is the source of a lot of her immune cells, and then replace it, and then just like any other any other kidney or liver transplant, you have to shut down which, the immune system so you don't have a, you don't have a reaction against it. Which is my opportunity to say to all of you, it was it's like successful. Commercial moment. Thank God and thank you for organ donors for people right. that will <laughs> contribute to somebody they don't even mm -hmm. know in terms of their chances of survival. Yeah, and she's and successful. Awesome. Yeah, I mean she's successful. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I'm not saying I, I'm not giving a blanket statement that that condemns chemo. I'm I, I'm saying that if you need it, you need it, and right. that's and that's fine because that risk of dying is higher than your risk of getting something else. But you are saying that but sometimes if you those don't specialists need it. are so myopically focused yes. that they're treating their specialty without regard for how it might impact yours or information or, or that patient. I mean, yeah. the patient's other problems. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask. You know, what other things could I get mm -hmm. because I'm getting radiation or because I'm getting chemo or, you know, what other things could happen down the line? Yeah. And we, you know, we use immune suppressants in other ways mm -hmm. and they're in many ways are life saving. Um, but you have to consider what the options are like autoimmune disorders. Many times we use we use. Drugs that shut down the immune system, and then you're set up for some other things. And I've had patients that have undergone that, too. But if that's what you need to live, then you take that chance. Well, it's just like every time you go in the hospital for surgery, they make you sign a little consent form saying you understand that sometimes you might die. people die because of <laughs> anesthesiology. Mm -hmm. you know, when you're here to get my cancer, the cancer is going to kill me. Am I really going to worry about the anesthesia? I'm no. going to sign the document because right. I, need the, I but, need the surgery. Yeah, and that's another legal medical thing yeah. that we, you know, consents are part of the, the legal medical life. But you should have a doctor who at least looks at everything and says, this is your risk of, you know, this is your risk of dying if you don't take this. Mm -hmm. And then this is the risk of what the chemo might do in the future so that you can then make the decision if, if you know, it's going to improve your chances by less than 1%, mm -hmm. but you have a high percentage of getting one of these other illnesses or other cancers, then you have to really look at it and just make your own decision. I had a, a friend years ago, 20 more or more years ago, who had a child with spina bifida. And the curvature of his spine suppressed his lungs so much that having anesthesiology was dangerous to him mm -hmm. because he would lose brain cells. The oxygen flow would be shut down mm -hmm. too long. And so every time he needed a health intervention, his parents had to agonize over whether he would come out of that intervention as himself or less than himself. Because as I as I knew him That's over a his difficult lifespan, situation. he got less functional and right. less aware. But, but that's lived. what we all. But that's, but that's the whole point of that's making medicine. Those that's choices. medicine. It we is. have great things to save our lives. Yeah. But you should know what those, what down the line those things can and could cause before you make that decision. Yeah. I mean, one one instance is somebody I know had a very early breast cancer, so early that the only reason that it was found is she said to me, "I've got a gut feeling I've got a cancer," and I went. And no, you listen. No masses. Yeah. No nothing. I said, so, okay, so we're going to do a mammogram and we're doing an ultrasound because mammograms don't catch every cancer. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at both. And then, and she went and she, she got her, her mammogram and they said, oh, it's clear. You don't need the ultrasound. And she said, oh, no, I'm getting my ultrasound. Mm -hmm. I want that ultrasound. Oh, no, they won't pay for it. She goes, I don't care. I'll pay for it, which is exactly what you should say right. if you really need this test. Oh, no, we're not going to do it. She said, I demand it. I'm not leaving here until I get my ultrasound. They did it, and then they came out and said, oh, we found this very tiny, very scary-looking thing. Yeah. And she had that gut feeling and I listened to her gut feeling and I sent her for the test. And so she had it all resected and she had a double mastectomy, which is not without risk, but she had a double mastectomy and, and they tested her nodes and they were negative. 
and then she was told she should have chemo and she's like why you know and it was going to improve her 0 0.02 percent right. but the risk was going to be for other things was going to be much yeah many yeah. many times higher than that yeah and she said i'm not doing that yeah and she's more than five years out so I, She's she's Such a good cured. decision for her. Yeah, and and I, I think her decision was right. It was one that I would have made for myself. Okay, so we wandered down this trail right, from because, discussion about the articles in the two journals. And yeah. <laughs> so in any case, yeah. let's let, let's go to the endocrine journals because uh -huh. we were talking about uh the GYN journals don't aren't really talking about menopause in a clinically useful manner. Okay, so that's that's kind of what I see there. But but interestingly enough, the articles in um, the um, endocrine journals are awesome. Mm -hmm. So there's and more gynecologists should read them. Yeah, I mean, really, we should be reading this journal. But but there's a, there's a thing. There's a um, there is a kind of an arrogance of each specialty where I'm surprised they even let me into the endocrine society but there's an arrogance of who they will take their research from and the OBGYNs will only take research from OBGYNs that's a problem because there's a lot of research out there that are, is not so from OBGYNs. So you're no longer a fellow. So if you get to a point where you want to publish your research about your <laughs> right. particular clients, will either of these people talk to you? Endocrine might. They might. But more likely the AMA journal, the uh, oh, the anti-aging journal. The anti-aging journal right. will take it. Yeah, yeah. So, so in the in the endocrine journal, uh, endogenous testosterone. That means the testosterone that you make yourself and its relationship to preclinical and clinical cardiovascular disease in community studies. So they looked at how how high your testosterone is and how or how low it is, and what is your risk of heart disease. That's pretty good, and for 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 docs that aren't even treating tes with testosterone, and they found that low testosterone levels increase the risk of heart disease. Yeah. It's a big study, and they did a great job. And this is the Division of Endocrinology, Baltimore, Maryland. So that's a good study. No one in my end is, you know, no one in in the urology world or the gynecology world is going to be reading that. Mm -hmm. um, then association between sex steroids, remember sex steroids are estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, and the development of metabolic syndrome, which is diabetes. pre-diabetes plus high blood pressure plus mm -hmm. high cholesterol, high risk for heart disease. And, and they did this is a European study. And they did it over many years. It was a longitudinal study. And basically, they said the lower the T levels, the worse the worse it is. That you have a more uh, more risk of developing diabetes and all of the symptoms of metabolic syndrome. So low testosterone disease. Not high testosterone, low. So that's endocrine journal. Metabolic syndrome is one of those examples of how the focus on particular illnesses and particular interventions gets to a place where they step back and see it more globally because they're, they're not just talking about diabetes, they're not just talking about high blood pressure, they're not just talking about some of these other things that you just named, but now they have a handle on the front end to call it metabolic syndrome, let's look for it, let's prevent it, let's treat it. And because it has high blood pressure and heart disease in right. it, the internists are looking at it. Okay. So because those two things are in that that syndrome mm -hmm. that they've devised since I was in medical school. They've never had that before. So in your book, you propose the use of terminology that'll do the same thing for the sex hormones. And you right. call it testosterone testosterone deficiency, deficiency syndrome. syndrome. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to get more physicians, more insurance companies, more people who study research doctors to agree that that's a good terminology and that it gives you a place to stand. I keep pushing my rock up the mountain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we have other things. They do research on OB, -GYN, I mean on uh, OB. They even do research on OB. I mean, polycystic ovary disease. Right. They, they do research on things that gynecologists should be reading. Or, or doing the research themselves. Yeah, or doing that research, but they're great studies. Yeah. I mean, they're they're well done they're studies. They're informative. They're helpful, and they have clinical application, which is what I'm looking for when I'm looking at as a clinician. And most of us are clinicians who are reading these journals. Mm -hmm. We're looking for advice and help in terms of dealing with problems that 
there are no answers that we were trained with in medical school. New answers. When I, as a counselor, when I go to national conventions, American Counseling Association, I am expecting that there will be conversations there, presentations there, about clinical skills. How do you intervene? What do you say? What works when you're dealing with this problem? Mm -hmm. That's not what they have at those meetings. What they have at those meetings are various university presentations about research that the university has done on some exotic or esoteric thing uh, like uh, refugee camps in the Sudan and the kind of emotional cause or benefit uh, of children from different tribal ethnic groups who play soccer together in the refugee camp. That's okay. interesting, but that's not going to help me come home to St. Louis, Missouri and deal with somebody who has anxiety and depression that are comorbid. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to know about that. Mm -hmm. I have a curiosity or an interest in the other, but I want to know about that. And that's not what I get at that organization. And that's why I went looking and found yes. the Endocrine Journal to, to help me yes. fill the void in the research that I was reading. So, and that's, I mean, that's what you have to do. So, and the anti-aging journals do the same. So the request at the end of the day is to help Sisyphus push the rock up the hill. Read the book, talk to your doctor, talk to your friends, especially the, the women in your lives who are approaching or have passed menopause because they're going to be coming face to face with all of these questions about their aging process and their good health. And there are answers out there that a lot of doctors are not yet knowledgeable about or accepting of. But once again, thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.